Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm Jennifer Overbo. I'm the Director of Product Strategy for the MBTI Assessment here at CPP, and I'm pleased to have you join us for our webinar. We'll be discussing the MBTI Step 2 Assessment, and we'll be going over and sharing with you some best practices for activities and debriefing um, tools that you can use within your workshop. So welcome to the MBTI Step 2 Forum Activity Series. Um, I want to remind you of a few logistical things before we get started. Um, today's presentation is scheduled for an hour. We will take the first 45 minutes to um, provide you with information from our speaker today, Sherry Haney. Um, the last 15 minutes are reserved for Q&A. So if you do have questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to let us know by using the chat feature within the GoToMeeting platform. Just send us your questions and we'll make sure um, Sherry can field those during the last 15 minutes. Um, I also want to remind you that we will send out, um, following the webinar, via email, a copy of today's presentation. Um, we're also going to send everybody who's joined us today um, a sample activity. So a free activity that will include the PowerPoint, um, all of the facilitation materials and worksheets that you need um, to conduct the activity um, in your next Step 2 workshop. So without much further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Sherry Haney. She is our um, MBTI Certification Program Facilitator here at CPP and an expert on the MBTI Step 2 assessment. She also serves as an organizational and development consultant here for us at CPP and that she provides our customers with um, assistance regarding how to apply the MBTI assessment within organizations. She currently consults with a multitude of Fortune 500 companies of all sizes. And in addition to conducting our training, she develops and facilitates initiatives for leadership, coaching, team building, performance management, and strategic planning. Um, prior to her time here, she was a consultant for General Motors, Ford Motor Company, Delta Airlines, and Waste Wayne State University through her independent consulting practice. So welcome, Sherry, and thanks so much for joining us. We're looking forward to learning more. Hello, thank you, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are. And yes, thank you for joining us. I'm very excited and look forward to sharing my insight and experience conducting two activities and exercises. And I look forward to hopefully answering some questions that you may have at the end of the broadcast about workshops and how you incorporate Step 2 activities in with your, your development program. And some of you may have attended our Step 2 webinar where we covered Step 2 interpretation. So if you have attended that, this would be a great follow-up for activities. If you have not attended the Step 2 webinar regarding interpretation, you might be interested in viewing that. It is recorded and on our resource section on the CPP website. I'd also like to point out that if you're not an experienced MBTI practitioner, I encourage you to attend our MBTI certification program. We also have a standalone Step 2 program for people who have prior qualification but have not necessarily experienced the Step 2 section. So I'd like to start with an overview of step one and step two and how you incorporate the two versions together. And then we will talk about different activities that can help you focus on understanding mid-zone results, the facet differences. We'll look at activities for team building. We will talk about leadership development and also coaching and career development. So we will end the session with some resources that will be helpful for you, promotions that we have, and also to answer any questions that you might have. So let's start with an overview of the instrument. And those of you that are new to Step 2, you will see the Form Q is our latest form for the Step 2 instrument. It includes 144 items which the 93 Step 1 items are included within the Form Q. So if you're interested in working with the individuals in your workshops or with coaching, 
and you want to begin with a basic form M interpretation, you don't have to administer both forms. You could administer just the form Q and generate all of the reports that we have available for Form M by administering Form Q. So the results are incorporated into Form Q for both Step 1 and Step 2. And it must go through our computer scoring to produce the Step 2 results. When you're looking at Step 2 results, you can see from our example here, there are five facet pairs under each dichotomy. So it gives you a richer, deeper, more detailed look at the characteristics for individuals under each dichotomy pair. So under extroversion and introversion, you can see the variety of distinctions, initiating, receiving, whether you are expressive or contained, and so on and so forth. So a much richer, deeper interpretation. So these facets are components of the four dichotomies that you see, and they provide insight into how you uniquely express your type. So as we all know of the 16 types, we have a lot of similarities with people who are of our same type, but there are uniqueness that from one person to the next, you might have two ESTJs that have some unique expressions for their particular type. So the step two does a great job at helping you to uncover and really illuminate what some of these differences are and how we uniquely express our type. It helps to really uncover what some of the patterns are that may reflect how less preferred aspects of our personality are expressed. And also to understand that we can have what are considered out of preference results and all of our facets may not necessarily align with our overall natural NA preference. So let's look first at the mid-zone results. If you have a score of 0 or 1 on either side, there's no judgment. And this, the theory is in line with MBTI step 1. We're, we're not measuring. We're not judging. For mid-zone, you would have 1 on either side or a zero. So that would constitute that particular category. And a question often comes up, why would someone have that mid-zone result? Why might they fall in the middle? And our research has shown that some people have a situational use of each of the poles. And it doesn't mean that you are necessarily unsure about what your natural preference is. And as you go through the interpretation process, whether you're working with a group, whether you're working with an individual, you may find that someone clearly can identify what their natural preference is. However, they may have a situational use of a particular facet pole that shows up as a mid-zone result. And through my experience, conversations, interpretations, working with groups and individuals, I have found that people who are clear with their step one result, yet they still have a mid-zone result, they can usually articulate what is going on in their environment or possibly the way they were raised as a child, particular influences through their culture. Could be um, an industry that they've worked in for 10, 20, 30 years, and they have actually developed habits that are required on the job and they have become very comfortable with those particular habits. And that can show up as a mid-zone result. So just want to make sure that it's clear that you can be very comfortable with your step one preference and that identifying your best fit type yet have these mid-zone results. It can also just be how you uniquely express your type. All of that said, I do want to point out another very important concept about mid-zone results. If you see someone with quite a few mid-zone results, and you're going through and you're looking at someone's results, and they are unsure, and they're having a difficult time identifying their best fit type, it can be a result of a situational use or an environmental pull away from their natural preference, so much so 
that they may struggle or have difficulty identifying their best fit type. So either situation could happen, and you as the experienced practitioner will be suited to help identify particular questions you can ask them, ask them when might you use that particular facet, when might you use the facet on the other side, and you can use this as an opportunity to help someone find their best fit type. And one thing that's very important to remember is that it's exciting to see these step two results, and you want to quickly start interpreting and doing activities and helping people to, to really see the insight that can be derived from step two, but we don't want to underestimate the importance of step one. It's still a required ethical part of the interpretation process to fully interpret step one, help someone identify what their best fit type is, and then you move into the step two interpretation and activities. So let's take a look at activities under the extroversion, introversion facets. So these are the facets that fall under extroversion and introversion. We have initiating and receiving, expressive, contained, gregarious, intimate, active, reflective, enthusiastic, and quiet. So you can see how we have these rich descriptions of these facets that fall under extroversion and introversion. As you become more skilled and more comfortable with the activities that you choose and select for your Step 2 workshops, you will find ways that you may tweak or change or do something a little bit different as you become more comfortable with each of the facets. So this first one that I'm going to share with you is an example of the initiating and the receiving facet pair. So for this activity, you would form three groups initiating, mid-zone, and receiving. So you will have three groups, and then you will share this particular question. Amongst yourselves in your groups, how do you introduce yourself at a social party? And we're, for example purposes, considering a non-work party. So you might think of a neighborhood party or some sort of social event that you attend outside of work. And for example purposes, 50 people, you know the host, and five other individuals. So there's your context and the setup for the activity. You will ask each group, discuss amongst yourselves from an initiating perspective, from a receiving perspective, and then also your mid-zone group, how many people would you interact with during the party, and when would you leave? And judge based on the flow of the conversations how much time you give them to have their discussion. And then you will lead the group in, in feedback and discussion about the activity. What's very important, especially the initiating and the receiving facet, is you will often hear the initiating group as you're providing and leading the feedback. The initiating group will often give helpful comments trying to fix or help the receiving folks overcome their behaviors of possibly wanting to leave early, being more comfortable interacting with just a few people. And what I have found in my experience conducting this activity is it's very interesting. The receiving folks will speak up and they will say, well, we appreciate your helpful tips, but we don't need to be fixed. So it's very important for you as the facilitator, you as the practitioner, to keep a very neutral tone and not try to interpret one as better than the other. And as MBTI practitioners, that is one of, one of our goals and one of the tasks that we're required to perform is to stay very neutral and positive about both sides. And there are positive attributes to being receiving. There are positive attributes to being initiating. And I usually lead the discussion, if it doesn't come up on its own, towards a work setting. So now that we've talked about a social setting or a non-work party, how does this facet play out for you in a work setting? And we often hear the receiving types mention that they will step outside of their comfort zone and behave in a way that may be more initiating in a work setting if they feel it's beneficial to get to know other individuals. And they may 
talk about ways that they have overcome that not feeling very comfortable for the sake of a work setting. So that particular activity can be very helpful with the extroversion and the introversion facets. So let's look now at sensing and intuition. For this particular facet pair, we see concrete versus abstract. How do you perceive the world? What do we focus on? Do you have a focus on realism or imagination? So what's common sense versus what can I imagine? Practical versus conceptual. Do you prefer to apply information, or do you prefer to explore concepts? Then we can look at experiential versus theoretical. What kind of information do you trust? And finally, traditional versus original. And you see that play out very often in your social or cultural or family environment. And think about how you approach holidays. For sensing and intuition, I have found that that particular dichotomy, sensing and intuition, greatly impacts how you learn, how you enjoy learning, how you learn best. This is, for this particular dichotomy, it's a great way to apply the concept of learning if someone is struggling to find their best fit to really attach that concept and have a discussion around learning. I usually will look, if I'm working with a team, do I have a good diversity or a good mix of these particular facets? And if there's one particular facet that has more diversity, I will pull out that facet to do the grouping. If, if you have a good mix, then I would choose concrete and abstract, or you could choose experiential and theoretical. So then you would form your three groups. If you have a group of concrete, mid-zone, and abstract, you could do your groupings that way. And for your discussion questions, for your three groups, you will ask, how do you like to learn? When you are required to learn outside of your preferred style, how does that affect you? How does that impact you? As a leader, if you're working with leaders, how can you adapt your accommodation to make sure that your learners are all being accommodated in their own way. You may have a, a team of 20 people with many different learning styles, different facets, and you need to learn to accommodate these different styles. So how can you do that? How can you learn to accommodate and adapt? As a team member, how can you adjust your environment, or how can you ask your leader or your manager to adjust the environment so it is optimal for your learning. So these are great questions, and the feedback you will often hear from leaders is it's a real aha moment to find that others do not learn in the exact same way that you do. Or if you provide instructions, and let's say you have a sensing or concrete as your facet, you might find it surprising the abstract learners are, are not understanding or not you're not getting the best from them when you provide concrete only instructions. That you need room for the creativity and the flexibility with how they like to learn. And they need the big picture. So make sure that during the feedback you allow examples to be shared of how they can flex their particular style to accommodate other learning styles. So let's look now at thinking and feeling. This particular dichotomy, we have the facets such as logical and empathetic. So what's your stance in decision making? We have reasonable and compassionate. Are you consistent and objective? Or do you focus more on the individuals? Then we look at questioning and accommodating. How do you deal with differences of opinion? Critical and accepting. Do you take a stance for more of a probing question, or do you seek consensus? And then finally, when you are carrying out a decision, are you tough or are you tender? So during that decision-making process, the thinking and the feeling facets 
definitely come into play with your decision making style. So for this particular facet set, so the thinking and the feeling facets, this is a great activity to utilize all of the facets for thinking and feeling. And this activity can take some time, so you want to make sure you have enough time to walk through the activity and have a discussion after each section to fully understand the differences between the styles. So for this particular activity, you start with the first set of facets, and that would be logical and empathetic. So we are forming three groups. We have a logical, mid-zone, and empathetic group. So you have your three groups. With a team, if this is a true intact team that you're working with, either as a consultant or within your organization, you can choose a real decision that they're currently working on. So there's probably something as a team that they are encountering that they need to make a decision about. If you have a mixed group of people or some sort of open enrollment program, then you'll need to choose a hypothetical decision that needs to be made. So for example purposes, if you need a hypothetical example, you can have this group ask this question about a, a budget cut. So here's your hypothetical example. You have to cut the team's budget by 20%. We are just looking at the first facet. So what we want to ask, what is your first thought about this? What's your first reaction? So you have a brief discussion. And I've noticed that over the years, as I have conducted this type of activity, it's important not to allow the discussion to continue beyond um, a reasonable amount of time. And the reason that's important for this particular activity is once we address a concept with our natural style or the facet that we feel most comfortable with, when we're given more time, we will often then start considering the opposite side. And the purpose of moving through the activity quick enough is to demonstrate and show that in a real life situation, we often have a limited amount of time in order to make a decision. That it's often a luxury to have an enormous amount of time. And when we do have more time, we typically balance our decision-making process naturally. But in a real-life setting, and we're trying to simulate a real-life setting, we don't have lots of time to make decisions. We're busy people, we have lots on our plate, and we usually make snap decisions or have to make decisions very quickly. So it's important to go through the activity and give them a few minutes to have a discussion about their first impressions with this particular example and then stop the group and start discussing and have some feedback about, about their thoughts. So once you move into the next set, you're looking at reasonable and compassionate. So reasonable and compassionate. And what you'll find is in a group setting, people will typically want to hold on to their step two report and keep it in their hands as they're moving from group to group. Because you might have quite a few individuals with out-of-preference characteristics, and they need to follow along with their report. So you may have people who, if they have out-of-preference characteristics, they are going to now move to a different group. If someone is all in line with their natural preference, they might stand in the same group setting throughout the whole activity. So reasonable and compassionate. Now we're still working on this same particular question about cutting the team's budget. So now we want to consider, during decision making, what kinds of criteria do you use? So you'll go through and you will have that discussion. Then you will move again into three groups, questioning, mid-zone, and accommodating. Ask the question. How do you approach differences of opinion in a group? So discuss this particular question. How does this play out for you? And 
a true intact team setting, you have to be very careful of a particular hierarchy that might be in the group. Is the leader there present? Are people comfortable to share their thoughts? Are they comfortable being candid? So you need to gauge their comfort zone when they're having the discussion. You move next to critical and accepting. How do you make sure that you're making the best decision? And what's very interesting is you may have the same end result, but very different ways that this plays out depending on the facet. So one thing that's almost always a point that comes up with critical and accepting, those that have a natural preference for feeling start to learn and often get the aha moment that those with a preference for either thinking or they have the critical facet, that they're not trying to attack or turn it into a personal attack. But often the person with the, the critical facet, they're just trying to learn more about the problem. And they might be just questioning and questioning and bringing out all of these comments that come across as critical, when in fact their intention is just to learn more and discover more about the problem. And they often find it uh, just really astonishing that those on the other side view them that harshly. So this can be a great aha moment, especially for people who work together and they have had conflicts in the past. This can often present very revealing information about each other that those that are accepting should learn to understand that the critical approach is usually the intention is to learn more about the problem. And the flip side of that, those that are on the critical side can learn that the accepting approach, that that is more comfortable when they are trying to make a decision that will result in a win-win solution. That the goal is we want everyone to have an outcome that is positive and productive. The final facet, tough and tender. So for the, this particular activity, you have implemented the decision, or you're going through, you have your decision, how do you implement it? Do you take a tough stance, or is your delivery style more tender? So this is all about your delivery style. And what we find when, when I have conducted this activity is often in the discussion, you end up with the same result, whether you have facets on the T side or more on the, the feeling side. And often you go through and you end up with the same result, but it's how you go about it, how you go through that decision-making process. And understanding these facets and understanding how someone who you work with, uh, someone who you live with, a friend, family, that the decision-making style can be very different. You can start to understand the root of conflicts and communication issues, so very important to understand how people make decisions. So let's look now at the judging and perceiving facets. We have systematic and casual, and that's just your general flow, general organization. We have planful and open-ended, so how do you arrange your leisure time, important life events, early starting, pressure prompted, how do you deal with deadlines, scheduled and spontaneous, What's your routine like? What's your daily activity like? Methodical and emergent. How do you sequence small tasks to large ones? How do you approach that? This activity, now you can use any of the facets. Our example here is with early starting and pressure prompted. So you'll have your three groups, and you'll ask these questions. What is it that you like about your facet results? What are the challenges? that you experience working with the opposite side. And for the mid-zone group particularly, what do they like about having that situational use of early starting and pressure prompted? And what challenges might they experience with each side? And this brings about usually a very rich and sometimes entertaining discussion. And you think about early starting folks the pressure and often anxiety that they experience 
when they work with someone who's pressure prompted and they don't understand how can they wait to the last minute to complete a task. And during feedback, you often hear great examples from the pressure prompted individuals describing, that's when I get my energy. That's when I feel like I'm doing my best work. And through the eyes of someone who is early starting, it's hard to understand. It's hard for them to put themselves in the other person's shoes and realize that for them personally, they don't do their best work at the last minute. But they have to learn to appreciate that the pressure-prompted individuals are energized. That's when they're most creative. And the flip side, the pressure-prompted individuals often don't understand why do you need to have it checked off? What if you're missing some important information that comes at the end? So it's really learning to appreciate that we all experience deadlines differently and we experience pressure differently. And if we can learn to appreciate that about our colleagues and about those that we work with and about ourselves, it really helps us to work better and have better relationships with others. Let's look at team building and how we can use step two facets when we're working with a team. What I'm showing you here is an example of a poster. We have a set of four posters, one for each dichotomy pair. So this is the extroversion, introversion poster. And you have all of the, the facets listed. The letters that you see, those are initials. And what I find this most helpful for, often in particular industries and organizations, you might have a very type-alike team. You might have, let's say, an engineering or manufacturing leadership team, and they're primarily ESTJ or ISTJ. The step two facets are wonderful to help really illuminate the diversity that you have that might not be apparent through step one results. So if you can show and highlight your step two facets, it's a great way to really focus on that diversity that you do have with a very type-alike team. So you can pull out these discussions about, let's say, for example, T, we'll say this is Ted. Ted most likely has a preference for introversion. We see that Ted has most of these facet scores on the introversion side. But for active and reflective, he is still on the reflective side, but a little closer to mid-zone. So he might be able to describe situations where he needs to be active in his role at work. So for example, if this is a leadership team, Ted understands the importance of getting out there and being involved with the workforce. Another example would be, let's say S is Sam. Sam is on the mid-zone for the in, uh, for the active and reflective, and Sam is, let's say he has more of a research role. So he needs the quiet time, he needs time alone to reflect and to really do his best work. So it's a great way from a team building standpoint to really look at the diversity that you have amongst your team members who could be otherwise very similar in their four-letter preference. So as you're debriefing and understanding more about your preferences, from a team setting, internally, amongst ourselves as a team, what are our similarities and differences? How does that affect our teamwork? How can we negotiate these differences that we have? How can we really learn to capitalize and tap into the diversity and the differences that we have? Externally, how do our results affect how we perform our jobs? How do other people view us? So consider how your step two facets can impact how others see you. How does that impact your, your performance? This is the activity that you will be receiving after the webinar. This is a great example for using the step two facets in a team setting. So the example here is dispersing money. So you can use this hypothetical situation your organization, and you would put in the number of employees, you have a certain budget, fill in the blanks, there's been a concern about morale, and you have X amount of dollars to spend. So you describe this context in the scenario, and your decision is, how will you spend this money? 
So within your team, you're going to work for about 15 to 20 minutes and chart your responses. And you're going to use the leadership, the decision-making model. If it's not a leadership team, it can simply be the, the team decision-making model. And the goal is to go through each of these facets and learn to give them equal focus and equal time. What happens naturally is we tend to rely on the preferences and the facets that we feel most comfortable with. So without a crutch and without a guide, my preference is for intuition and thinking. I might be more inclined to make a decision based on the big picture, the, the theoretical concepts, and then I'll go and weigh the logic, the pros and cons, and I might take a critical stance and be very questioning. So that would be my natural approach, but I know it's important to be very balanced. And I, if I overlook something, there could be some very clear black and white costs there could be some historical evidence. There could be things that I'm overlooking that could save me time if I properly address sensing. If I overlook feeling as an individual or as a team, there might be some clear indicators of how it could be hurting particular team members or hurting people in our organization if I don't properly address feeling. So this is a great way as a team to go through and making sure that you're addressing each of these categories with the same amount of focus. You can use this individually as well as on a team. So it's a great way as a crutch, as a guide, to help make sure that you're going through and making very fair decisions. Let's look now at leadership development. This particular activity is a great way to uncover and illuminate biases that we have as leaders. Now, this particular sheet that we're looking at is from our Step 2 binder. And I recommend that you pull out and use these worksheets and have individuals go through and identify what do they feel is essential for a successful employee. So as a leader, you can use a colored pen. Let's say you're going to use yellow and highlight what I feel is, is most important and essential to be successful. And then go through with a different colored highlighter and identify characteristics that you might find undesirable. So what you're doing is you're uncovering what biases you might have as a leader. And with this information, you can chart things about you. What are some of these biases that I've identified that I, I really may be struggling with? And what biases have I identified that might not be particularly true, that I've learned as a leader, that I, I wouldn't necessarily use that to judge someone. What are some things that I've learned to control? And what are some biases that I really need to work on? So that bottom right hand quadrant, these are areas that you really consider development opportunities. What are some things that you feel you, you might really have a bias or it might be blinding you to other perspectives and really limiting your abilities as a leader to be open-minded. So think about what some of your development opportunities, are there judgments that you've been making, and it may be an unconscious judgment, but you can definitely bring this to your conscious awareness and create some wonderful development opportunities as a leader. So let's now move into the coaching and career development. So those of you that work as individual coaches, consultants, or if you're a career counselor, if you work with students, the Step 2 report is a great way to really help identify what are some of your strengths and development opportunities. And that would be very customized and individual, depending on what your goals are. So if you're working with an individual and you identify what are your goals, what are some things that you want to achieve, and through the Step 2 report, you can identify whether it's learning to really leverage your strengths or your facets, or are there particular facets that are not out of preference and it's outside of your comfort zone that you've decided it would be very helpful for you to learn to develop. You could be looking at a new role or a job or as a student, you've identified a career path 
and there are particular areas that you want to develop so that you feel more flexible and you feel very well rounded so that you can be successful in the role that you've identified. It's a great way to help develop a resume or prepare for an interview. Often in an interview situation, you're asked questions such as, what are your weaknesses? And this step two, richness, can really help you really turn that question around and identify what you might consider development opportunity as opposed to a weakness. Or really learn to articulate what some of your strengths are and what your comfort zone might be. The application pages for the step two report are wonderful because it really helps highlight what your particular style is, but gives you areas for enhancement. Here are some ways that you can develop outside of your comfort zone. So for example, let's say you're enthusiastic and you readily show enthusiasm for the particular subject. A development opportunity, be careful not to overwhelm or override others. Make sure that you ask for input. Sometimes your enthusiasm can come across as disregarding other people's opinion. So there is a, a flip side to all of your strengths. At times, you need to be aware that your strength could come across as a weakness if you overuse it or if you use it in the wrong setting. So the goal of, of Isabel Myers is that we want to become aware of differences and really understanding the value of differences. So it, it's wonderful to accept who you are and to be comfortable with your own style and how you communicate and make decisions. But in, or, in order to work better with others, to be more effective in your type, we need to acknowledge that there are differences and, and seek out those differences. Learn to practice new behaviors, practice incorporating different perspectives into our own processes. So whether you're using step one or you're combi combining step two facets and step two into your workshop, it's, it's great to really make sure people are comfortable with that. They're not just trying to change who they are. You can't change who you are, but your goal is to appreciate differences and learn to flex, learn to step outside of your comfort zone and practice behaviors that might be more appropriate in a particular setting or context. And we have, we have a quote in summary from, from Isabel. Whatever the circumstances of your life, the understanding of your type can make your perceptions clearer your judgment sounder, and your life closer to your heart's desire. So I think that's a great quote from Isabel that really summarizes how we want to, to utilize MBTI out in the world. I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer now. Thank you, Sherry. Um, before we move into Q&A, which we'll do in just a minute, so feel free to continue submitting your questions. We've received some great ones so far. I just wanted to go over with you a few of the resources, because Sherry has mentioned a variety of different exercises, um, some of which we've taken from um, our certification program binder. Others are available through our um, working with MBTI Step 2 results binder. So just real quickly, want to make you aware of some resources that can help you um, become more familiar with step two, the step two assessment, um, and using um, different activities uh, alongside of the step two assessment. The first is our working with step two results. Um, it is a binder um, by Jean Kumaro and Naomi Quank, and has quite a few exercises listed in it. Um, we also offer an MBTI step two training program. Um, which is a one-day program that will take you deeper into how to use the MBTI Step 2 assessment, how to interpret results, and how to apply them, both one-on-one um, -on -one and in group settings. Um, if you've never been certified on the MBTI um, assessment, you can attend the MBTI certification program, and there is a full day devoted to the MBTI Step 2 assessment there. And I also want to make you aware of the fact that we do have the MBTI Step 2 Facets posters available for sale. Those are the posters that Sherry was referencing on one of her slides. Um, we recently have made those available to anybody who'd like to use them in workshops. And I wanted to reference our MBTI activity series. Those are available as downloadable activities. They are online on cpt.com slash MBTI activities. 
Um, that thinking feeling is an application of MBTI type um, that is specific to step two, the step two assessment. So I just wanted to call that one out, and there are a few others that you can find there um, on ctp.com slash MBTI activities that might give you some ideas for your next workshop. Um, and I also just wanted to let you know that um, for those of you who have attended today, we are going to offer an exclusive 15% discount off of the binder that I just mentioned, working with MBTI Step 2 results, um, which again is designed to help you make the most of the assessment um, and, and the activities that can go along with that within workshop settings. So we will run that through the end of July and hope you'll take advantage of it if you haven't already purchase the binder. So now I'd like to move into questions and answers. You all have um, submitted quite a few, so we're going to try to go through um, and answer those. Anything that Sherry doesn't address, I will address one-on-one -on -one with you um, either um, during the webinar or immediately following. And again, just a quick reminder that we will send out the slides to everybody who's attended, along with a free activity, um, which Sherry mentioned during the webinar. Um, the dispersing money activity is one that we will send out to all of you. Um, it will include the PowerPoint slides, the instructions, um, and any of the handouts that go along with it. Okay, Sherry, for our first question, um, it came early on in the presentation, but we have some folks who are interested in um, if you could just address an exercise that uses the step two results for improving communication. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. If you are focusing on communication, I would say use of the decision-making model would be a, a tool that you could incorporate during a conversation about improving communication. And the way that you could incorporate that activity, and this is, many of you know it as the Z model, you've seen it as the problem-solving model, you may have seen it as we presented today, the decision-making model. But when used as, as a really a problem-solving or communication tool, you can address and highlight how we communicate is based on how we gather information, either through sensing or intuition facets, and how we make decisions. So often that comes across, and our bias towards our natural preference it might come across as very different from someone that has different characteristics, different facets, different natural preferences. And it can create conflict or communication problems. So take that Z model, the problem-solving decision-making model, and create either as a team or as a pair, as, as two individuals, and walk through a current issue that you're dealing with, together as two people or together as a team. And, and discuss, let's say, well, we'll use a personal example. You and your significant other. And you might be having an argument about money. So you could actually use this, this problem solving technique and go through sensing and give each other the opportunity to answer the sensing questions. What do we know? What are the facts? What's the historical data? And each person equally give your input. Then move into intuition. What's the big picture here? What are, what are the long-range implications to making this large purchase or saving the money instead? And then move into thinking. Weigh the pros and cons. Poke some holes in it. Then move into feeling. How would each of us feel as an end result? How does this impact us individually, as, as individual people? And by forcing yourselves either as a team or, or as a couple to go through and as a practice make sure that you're addressing openly each of these areas. You can start to see where you might have judged the other, you might have been biased towards your own communication preferences, and how you can learn to be more open-minded. So I think that's a great application for communication. Great. Thanks, Sherry. Um, I'd also like to just call out that we do have a communication section within the Step 2 report um, that I know you've referenced previously in other webinars um, and, and somebody commented on that would also be a place to start if you're using um, the MBTI Step 2 assessment um, for communication. 
Would you Absolutely. agree, Terry? Okay. Absolutely. And those application pages, there's one that addresses communication, conflict, and decision making. So depending on your particular focus area, that's a great way to highlight, here's your typical communication style. What are some things that you can do to enhance and, and develop? So great, great point. And we've, we have received a few questions from those in the audience who are using the MBTI Step 2 assessment with students. Um, so I'm going to, to actually pose a question. And Sherry, it's a fairly detailed question because it's a specific scenario that somebody would just like to get some feedback on. So if you bear with me, I will repeat it if needed. Um, but this individual was working with a person who is an INFP preference has INFP preferences, and who had been extremely interested in facts courses like mathematics and accounting during his high school years. So an INFP with interest in, in math and accounting and facts-related subjects. Um, and a reason for confusion on the SN dichotomy is his interest in math, math and accounting courses during high school. So he was questioning why, why do I have this interest in these types of courses? And the question is, would step two results that show an out of preference um, for, on the TF dichotomy help answer this confusion? So essentially, how would you use the MBTI step two assessment to, to maybe uh, get a better understanding of why a particular individual may have had um, interests that don't seem to align with their four-letter type preferences? Sure, and, and that's a great question. I think it's very applicable to students as well as individuals in a work setting when they go through their career. But from the student perspective, if this particular person has interest in those areas, and remember the, the MBTI is one part of who we are. It doesn't explain everything that there is to know about you. It, it helps you to examine what your innate preferences are, and that very much carries a lot of weight throughout your life. But it doesn't explain everything that there is to know about a person. So you can have an, an INFP that has a math and science interest, and they may certainly show out of preference characteristics, maybe towards concrete, maybe towards questioning. And, and you may see that show up in step two. So step two could help you to correlate these possible interests. But I think that the bigger question here is if the person is, is happy with their life and they're not experiencing any sort of anxiety or distress and they're not already forced into a role that they feel is not a good fit for them, then, then that's just another interesting part of who they are. And we're all unique. MBTI preferences are one part of who we are. But my, I'm going to to take a leap of a, a leap into um, a possible conclusion without knowing who the student is, without knowing this person, my thought is there may be some sort of long-term interest that for their own personal growth and development or a particular career interest that they may have, and they see the math and, and maybe the financial, uh, scientific concepts as a tool or a means to an end that they feel that having that skill set will help them accomplish a long-term goal. And I, I say that because working with individuals who either comfortably or uncomfortably choose to learn certain skill sets, they do so because it's a means to an end. And an INFP, maybe there's some sort of, maybe they're an activist, or maybe they have an interest in some sort of, um, let's say, a, a cure for cancer. Let's say they want to move into scientific research. Their INFP preferences might very much align with the end result, but knowing that they have to follow these steps or go through these core curricula in order to accomplish that goal. And again, we're all unique and different, and they might find it fun and exciting and interesting, but I'm guessing there may be some sort of linkage to a long-term result. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Sherry. Um, we, we've also received um, two different questions, so around using the MBTI Step 2 assessment with virtual teams. 
So I'm wondering if, if you can offer any advice or suggestions for things you might be you might recommend doing differently or activities um, for use in a virtual setting. And in particular, we had an individual ask about those step two facet posters, which of course um, are available in printed form and I believe are also available in the certification program materials um, as a visual slide that could be used you know, during a virtual team building. But if you have any ideas around how you would use some graphics or visuals like those posters in a virtual setting or any other ideas for facilitating a workshop in a, for a virtual team, but one that you know, is using the MBTI Step 2 results um, as a facilitation um, tool. Sure. Well, if you have the technology, and I'm, it, it would depend on what you have access to, but if you can either from the posters in, into a, an electronic format, and you have the tools to highlight and have it an interactive visual experience where you go through each person's facets and have them mark onto their screen where their facet falls and have a discussion around each. So of course that would depend on the, the technology that you're working with. Another option would be to take the problem-solving decision-making model and actually the slides that you'll be receiving as, as a result of the webinar you can build those slides and start out with just the sensing facet and have a discussion and the facilitator, if they could add interactively throughout the session, the names of who might fall under that particular preference, but have it more of an interactive uh, use of that problem solving and just reveal each preference characteristic one at a time and have more of an interactive conversation. That might be helpful. Great, thank you. And I, I, we have one last question, Sherry, and then I think that's probably all we have time for. Um, do you have any other recommendations for using the MBTI Step 2 assessment um, to, to develop student leaders? You've gone through some exercises, I think, those exercises obviously apply to student leadership, but we did receive one question for any anything else that you might recommend for use with students. Well, I, I think it would be a great way as student leaders to really demonstrate how they can be role models and how they can model leadership characteristics. And by modeling leadership characteristics for their peers, they can they can learn to demonstrate flexing outside of your natural preferences. So going through a basic interpretation and then identifying what your step two out of preference characteristics might be, what your facet scores might be, and learning to demonstrate how they can capitalize on what their strengths are, how they can learn to flex and enhance their development outside of that natural preference, and really demonstrate the role model capabilities of a leader. And as students, part of their, their own personal development will be learning to be an exemplary leader so that when they are out in the workforce, they will have developed skills that will translate into being a very successful employee. Great. Thanks, Sherry. Um, I think the very final question that I guess if we have a couple minutes, if you could just speak to, would be, um, could you go over the um, using the MBTI Step tool in a coaching environment? I know we've been focused on activities, but we have received a few questions about that. Abs absolutely. And it's often used in a coaching environment because you do need more time to interpret Step 2 results. I recommend in a coaching environment you separate a Step 1 and a Step 2 session. So you go through a basic interpretation with the MBTI and then give an opportunity and some space in between for some learnings, for some aha moments. And then bring the person back individually and present the step two. And the step two interpretive report, it's 17 pages, very in-depth, great way to go through and identify in a coaching environment what are some of your goals, what are some things that you aspire to do, what are some things that, that you really need to focus on capitalizing some of your strengths, and go through the examples in the Step 2 report and identify 
ways that you can practically learn to practice outside of your natural preference. I would also recommend the booklet using your step two results. And also, uh, some of the practitioner guides that we have can help you as a practitioner to help them build skill around learning to practice flexing outside of their natural environment. It would also be great to coordinate with a 360 result. And I'm sure at a later time you can learn more about the LPI, which is a product that we're working with. And if you can identify from your peers and colleagues and managers, what are some of the characteristics? How are you being described by others? And then how can you use your step two results to help develop and possibly change some behaviors that could help you to change your perspective and how you're viewed by others? So step two is a great way to get some really in-depth feedback, practical ways coach others. Great. Thank you so much, Sherry. We are running up against time, so I want to let you know if you did not receive an answer to your question, we will follow up with you individually and get those questions answered um, post-webinar via email. And real quickly, I just want to mention that we are going to send a follow-up email along with the slide presentation, but for anybody who's opted out, you can update your email preferences and ensure that you get emails from CCP like this one at cpp.com slash email press, P-R-E-S-S, -S, email press. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Hope you all have a fantastic afternoon and join us next time.